Welcome everyone. This is our second meeting of our New Hampshire vaccine, uh, COVID-19 Vaccine Alliance. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is uh, just for a little bit of background for those who haven't participated. This is an effort in collaboration with the Division of Public Health Services. Uh, our mission, as you can see up on the sc uh, screen, is to support uh, vaccine confidence accurate, consistent information um, and foster coordination of vaccines allocation. We try to do that with three goals in mind to promote buy-in, public buy-in for the vaccines uh, to increase immunization rates. Um, mostly we're uh, trying to really act as a force multiplier to support uh, the vaccine communication and allocation plans uh, for the Bureau of Infectious Disease Control Immunization Programs. We also will over time work on countering misinformation about the vaccines um, and will uh, hopefully help uh, support uh, use of the uh, of uh, New Hampshire's vaccine registry uh, called the Immunization Information System. My name is Jim Potter. I'm the Executive Vice President uh, of the New Hampshire Medical Society. We do this in our in partnership uh, with our core members. Um, uh, the New Hampshire Hospital Association and the Business and Industry Association. Uh, also, next slide, please, Brian. I'd like to, to thank our sponsors uh, who have helped us uh, raise a considerable number of funds uh, to support these efforts going forward. Um, again, uh, our efforts are here not to try to duplicate, but to try to help coordinate what we're doing um, and, and how we can move this together uh, as a, a community supporting the vaccines. Uh, today, our focus is going to be primarily on the vaccine allocation for phase 1A. You may have seen uh, this past week on the 24th, uh, vaccine instructions to the quote, most risk uh, practitioners, first responders were sent out. Um, uh, if you have not received those, then uh, please send me an email to james.potter, P-O-T-T-E-R, at nhms.org. Again, that's James Potter at nhms.org. And we'll make sure you get that. In other supporting informations, if your facility is also interested in providing uh, vaccines or distributing the vaccines, um, then there are also forms uh, to be completed that you can send back to uh, the department. Uh, at this time, what I'd like to do is to turn the program over uh, to, uh, to Dr. Chan um, and to T.W. Hall, who are joining us from uh, the department. Uh, Dr. Chan, T.W.? Great. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all once again for um, being on and, and joining us as we uh, look to move vaccine out into our community um, and rely on all of you to help with those efforts um, and certainly also the messaging and the importance around um, vaccination. Um, I, I don't have uh, a lot to say, so I'm going to hand things directly over to uh, TW, but want to thank you all again. You know, I think a lot of what we're dealing with now in public health is the logistics of trying to <clears throat> move this out. Um, and the, the complexity of doing that on a very large scale. And so we wanna to continue to work with all of you to make that as successful as possible. Um, and so we're still working toward that goal of getting vaccine out. Um, and as I'm sure TW is gonna talk more about, uh, today is the day that we're uh, opening up some of our um, fixed vaccination sites to try and move vaccine from facilities such as hospitals and long-term care facilities uh, more to the community. and frontline health workers and first responders. Um, and we're gonna be looking at doing that primarily through 13 different fixed vaccination sites around the state. And so we've developed a process for how people can um, register and identify themselves as being part of that prioritized group um, and then register online for um, getting back vaccinated at one of those sites. So with that, let me stop and hand things over to TW, thanks. Good afternoon all. Um, First, let me say thank you for everything that you guys are, are doing and continue to do um, with, our, with, with our response and, and for the citizens of New Hampshire. I truly appreciate um, everything that you all have done as a part of this response and, and as providers in general. Um, 
what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through and, and just uh, quickly uh, sum up uh, a couple of points from last week, and then I'll move into the, the new stuff for, for this week. So from last week we on our call, we kind of talked about um, some fairness and equity, how different decisions get made in terms of who's in what category and whatnot, um, how that's vetted um, through um, the state disaster uh, medical committee and others to try and make sure that we've got fairness and equity throughout our, our response. Um, and we also talked about um, overall in the response having two sides of this response, the private side of the response and the public side of the response, or a, maybe a better way to put it would be the, the, the part of the response driven by the New Hampshire government in terms of um, some openings and some availability that they have for that. And then for um, um, the non-government side of the response, whether or not you're a nonprofit or, or private or, or whatnot in terms of your organization. Um, when we're talking about those responses from the, from the, from the um, government side of the response, we're talking about really two, two main ways that people get vaccinated through this. First are those fixed sites that we're talking about, and that's ideally where we want the majority of our throughput to occur. That's where we're focused on efficiency, um, making sure that we've got a good way to get you logged into that system, working through that and, and vaccinated, and then back out. Um, and of course, maintaining safety and, and, and trying to keep good customer service uh, up in terms of people that um, have questions and show up. However, trying to do what we can to make sure that people have the information that they need prior to sign, prior to coming there, so that the questions that are asked are you know last minute questions, or maybe they need some some further um, discussion or or whatnot. But the majority of the conversations, hopefully, will be obtained before they come, so that we can again try and and work through getting people vaccinated as quickly and as safely as possible. The other side of the government response is the mobile clinics and the mobile clinics are run by our regional public health networks and they are they are designed for that last that that last piece of equity so so being able to go into different regions um, different locations and be able to vaccinate those groups to assist with different areas that was the uh, originally before CDC gave us the contract of um, of uh, working with the PPP, the, the Pharmacy Partnership Program, um, and developing a contract with CVS and Walgreens in order to do that with our long-term care facilities. It was the mobile clinics that were going to go in um, through the regional public health networks to vaccinate our, our long-term care facilities. So their job is again to be mobile. Their job is to, to bring vaccine and vaccinators to a location to be able to vaccinate and, and help work through that. So that's that's our piece that we have that's a little bit more nimble and, and trying to uh, do what we can to, to help out and assist. Overall, as we move in past 1A, our goal will be to first provide structure and support to those that, that are already established in these work environments. And so to that end, that's where we're looking at, at getting the provider agreement. So the provider agreement went out last week. Um, this provider agreement is for you to be able to uh, administer COVID vaccine, receive it, um, administer it to, to patients in your population. And that's really set up to start at the 1B time period. And so if you have an interest in doing that, which I hope many of you do, um, then you can fill out that, that, that form. And that form is what starts um, the, the process of making sure that you have the right things for storage and handling, that you have the right um, uh, guidance and education in terms of um, what you're reporting, how to do that, um, all, those types of, all those types of endeavors. When we talk about overall, where we, we get into um, different areas, let's say home health, for example, or something like that, um, homebound patients or things like that, ideally our, our first goal out of that, to, to use that as an example is, to support the existing medical structure that's already in place and to get a provider agreement in place with that, with that agency, with that group to, to provide that so that they can then go forth and, and, and vaccinate. That is them doing that on their own medical direction. We are just um, more or less bringing, bringing the party favor, so to speak, right? We're, we're bringing in the vaccine and, and we're getting it to those organizations so that they can then follow their, their procedures, their guidance, their everything else to vaccinate those groups. So, 
that's kind of how the the government non-government uh, entities are we're, we're trying to get that that to coalesce and work together um, and I think so far um, it's it's been very positive in terms of the feedback and the and the everything else that we've gotten from uh, from the different organizations to try and set this up. There's definitely a lot of a lot of uh, challenges to overcome with this, and so um, we're we're doing our best to to do that and take feedback uh, from out in the field and and improve our processes and whatnot. Um, some of those I'm going to bring up on the call here today in terms of um, when you're going in and scheduling and and doing different things. So as Dr. Chan mentioned, we have opened up our our fixed sites to allow for most risk health workers in ambulatory care settings, most risk health workers in other uh, healthcare settings, and first responders to be vaccinated right now. And that's through those fixed sites. There are some mobile clinics that are happening as well to try and, and assist with this uh, lift and whatnot um, to try and do that. But again, we're trying to save the mobile clinics as much as we can for a time in which there really is a strong need because we just have that mobile clinic piece to cover all these different population groups. So, so that's our kind of our last piece for that. So, so when, when you're trying to figure out um, how to access the process and whatnot, um, there has been information that was shared through um, uh, many different organizations, but one of them being the Medical Society on how you would sign up. There's a link that you go to, that link takes you to an online form. That online form asks you to um, fill out some demographic data it also asks you to delineate which, which bucket or which group you're in. So um, if you're like me and I, I say, well, what does uh, healthcare workers in other settings really mean? Um, you know, what's your definition of ambulatory? Those types of things. Um, it has a list on there of what the other health, other, you know, other settings are in terms of healthcare workers as we've defined it. That allows us to, to put you in the right bucket, so to speak, or the people signing up in the right bucket so that we can fairly allocate um, our slots at the fixed sites to these different groups. So if you're talking about whether or not you're working in an ambulatory care setting, then based on the, uh, on the data that we've collected, there's X number of ambulatory care workers in a public health region. So what we do is we say, okay, we've got, let's say we got 10,000 doses coming into the state this week. So we've got 10,000 doses coming into our state this week. We have, uh, 500 uh, healthcare workers that are in the ambulatory care setting um, that are in, uh, let's say, one public health region, right? So we take that 10,000, we go, okay, so how are we going to get down to the ambulatory care? First, what we have to do is we have to break up the public health region by population and, and amount of healthcare workers that we know are working in that region. So we break that out because obviously North Country is different than Manchester or whatnot in terms of those numbers. So we take that 10,000 and we break out the pieces by regional public health network. Then once we have that, we say, okay, so the total doses, and I'm gonna say North Country, the total doses going to North Country this week are 2,000. So how are we gonna break up those 2,000? Well, we've got a percentage or a portion of ambulatory care workers that we need to do. We've got a portion of, of um, first responders and a portion of healthcare workers in other settings that we need to account for. We don't want a system set up in which we put um, all, of our, all of our appointments to first responders or all of our appointments to ambulatory care settings. So we wanna be very clear and methodical in how we break up those settings and make sure that there's equal opportunity for that. There's also a further delineation that occurs with the mobile clinics so that we're balancing equitable, equitably between a mobile clinic and a fixed site, right? So the goal of all of these uh, delineations and figuring this out is to make sure that it doesn't matter if you're in an ambulatory care setting and you're affiliated with a hospital or whether or not you're in an ambulatory care setting that's a private practice. We want to make sure that that's equitable distribution all the way down through all of these different categories and groups to make sure that, that things are fair. So um, it doesn't matter whether or not you sign up with a mobile clinic, whether or not you go to a fixed site, whether or not you're a part of a private practice or a hospital, all of those get delineated and broken out evenly amongst the different areas. And so 
when we talk about um, these different areas, that's where we're, we're, we're leveraging the data that we've collected and, and the data that we have to then say, okay, so let's take ambulatory care workers, for example, there's 42% of ambulatory care workers in the state that is associated with uh, hospitals. So then for our ambulatory care bucket for the entire state, right? We want to make 42% of that go to the hospitals in their various allocations. And then we want the rest of it to go to the fixed sites so that there's equitable distribution, regardless of whether or not you're in an ambulatory care setting with a hospital or an ambulatory care setting in a private practice. So I know that's that's a lot of different things. I, I apologize if it's if it comes across confusing. Um, there's several of us that have stayed up very late at, at different nights trying to trying to figure out the best uh, methodology for this in terms of fair and equitable distribution. I wanted to just kind of talk through that a little bit with you all um, so that you understand that. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was again a couple of the a couple of the different ways that you will see how we go through things and to try and share some transparency with that. So once you complete that online form, and you're bringing that online form um, up, what that does is that gets brought into a group that is responsible for then taking the numbers that we give them of the amount of vaccine that we got coming into the state. And you take those amount of vaccine coming into the state and you go, okay, so we have enough at our fixed sites after we've done all of this various allocations to, to have 600 slots in Manchester for ambulatory care workers. So that are not affiliated with a hospital. So they then take that information, they take the people that are filling out the form online, and then they say, okay, out of those people that are filling out their form online, we can open up 600 slots for this week to have people schedule after they've completed that form. So then that's kind of how the slots open up and how we make sure week to week that we are opening up um, the right um, percentage or the right allocation of slots for people to schedule. What does that mean to you all as the, as the end user, right? Is you all filling out that form? That means that as you fill out the form, depending on the allocation and where we come in. So if I'm the, if I'm the, you know, 50,000th and one person to sign up for the ambulatory care bucket, and there's 50,000 people that we're still trying to process and work through then it could be that it takes a week or two for you to get a response back to then set up your clinic and your schedule. The whole goal of this entire program and the, and the way that we've set this up is to make sure that we are not creating a process that limits the number of doses that we can administer. Instead, what we're trying to do is, is make sure that the allocation that comes to us is the limiting factor on the number of clinics that we can set up. And, and the throughput in which we can do to get people vaccinated. So that's kind of why we've taken the, the, the stance that we have and, and how we're working to pull some of those numbers together. So to make sure that, that again, as soon as we have an amount of vaccine that we know is, is getting distributed and administered, people can sign up for that, go through that. And then again, it's delineated into those buckets so that, so that if you're a, Healthcare worker in another setting, you get your you get your your fair shot at getting signed up, so to speak. Um, once you get in and you and you get that, then it gets sent out in a in a VAMS email. So if you do not have an email, then um, we've worked on the form to basically allow you to say, "Look, I do not have an email." If you don't have an email, then that triggers a call from the from the call center to then call you and set this up and walk through this process with you. If you have the email, which we're hoping that the majority of people do, then they will go through and they will get an email saying, hey, look, there's a slot available for you to sign up. Go ahead and sign up. You then go in and you sign up and you say, okay, so I've now, I've now gone into the VAM system. I'm now answering the questions in the VAM system. So some of them will seem repetitive from what you filled out on the form beforehand. And the reason for that is because we want you on that form, on that initial form that we're talking about, that's on that link that you get right, right away, right? That you should already have to fill stuff out. That link and that setup on that form is to, is to walk through. And it's for people that are obviously <laughs> not as medically educated as you all are, but it's to walk through and say, hey, look, so if you're lactating, if you're, if you're pregnant, if you're immunocompromised, 
you want to have these types of conversations with your healthcare provider. We don't want you to then get the VAMS request to sign up and you hearing for the first time that that's when you need to have that conversation with your healthcare provider. We want you to have as much time in between those two processes so that we can allow for that conversation to occur. So you go back into VAMS, right? You finally get your, you, you get your invitation and you go, okay, so I'm all set up in VAMS. I'm now gonna walk in and I'm gonna sign up. So I sign up and I get my invitation and I'm now in the VAMS application itself. And I'm filling out all my demographic data and I'm filling out some questionnaires and I, I fill all that information out. And then it says, okay, so TW, you're now, your time is now up for you to schedule. And so I then get a map, um, or well, before I get the map, I, I put in an area code or a zip code, and uh, good thing it's not area code, um, but a zip code, and put in a zip code for, for where I'm living at. And it says, okay, do you wanna see clinics within 15 miles, 20 miles, 100 miles, what do you wanna see? I select what that is. I then get a, a, a map that pops up, right? Now here's one of the challenges with VAMS. That map that pops up, pops up with every clinic that has a capability of being scheduled. So the challenge out of this is, is that the VAMS, um, the VAMS system, right, is designed by Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So that system is designed and set up so that anyone can sign up anywhere. So I cannot take me, TW, as a hospital and give me a special password that only allows me to schedule at a hospital site. I could schedule or I could set up theoretically and I could schedule at a hospital site, a fixed site, or any of the other clinics, either be in this state or out of this state um, that I see on that map. So that's obviously a, a, a big limitation in terms of VAMS and what our capabilities are with that. We have worked with that in several different ways and there's no way that we can change the technology to fix that. So here's what that means. That means that all of our communication that we're pushing out is to have people go into the right buckets. So that means that if you're affiliated with a hospital, that only those that are affiliated with a hospital sign up with a hospital clinic. Only those that are not affiliated with a hospital or our first responders are signing up through a fixed site. We will continue to work on our messaging and push that out but I want you all to, to have clarity into the process to understand that, that when we, these clinics come up, there's no way to just make sure that only people that are affiliated with a hospital only go in through that. So what that means is, is that we have, we have kind of a screening process on the back end where we're going through and we're looking through everything and, and we're encouraging the hospitals to do the same thing to make sure that certain, certain you know, that example for the hospitals, they're only vaccinating those that are affiliated with them, whether or not they be in ambulatory care or whether or not they be in the hospital organization, they're still only taking care of their groups, right? Because moving back to how we're delineating who gets what in terms of vaccine, if I have a hospital now that's all of a sudden vaccinating a lot of other ambulatory care practices that are not affiliated with them, then I have put my vaccines in the wrong bucket, so to speak. And now the hospital is going to be short, but we might have more at the fixed site. So. Again, the goal is to try and communicate this all out and to try and do what we can to get people to, to stay in those, in those swim lanes, so to speak. So um, that's one of the challenges that we're gonna have with VAMS. Um, and one of the reasons why we'll, we'll probably be looking to um, move away from it in, in later, later periods of this, uh, this vaccination effort when we get into maybe 1B and beyond and start to look at that, why we'll, we'll see if we can leverage a different system to be able to, to, be able to account for some of these challenges that we have. Terrific. I've taken a, a lot of time to, to go through different things. I apologize for that, um, but I wanted you to kind of have some idea into the logistics and the scheduling, how we're figuring out what vaccines have come through. Um, I'd be more than willing to open it up for questions at this time to clarify anything that I might have said. Uh, thanks, TW. That's uh, a lot of information. Um, again, Jim, I think you're on mute oops. right now, or it's, for some reason, I'm not hearing you at least. Uh, how's that? Um, thank you, TW. Uh, that's a lot of information. We really appreciate um, all your efforts in moving forward. Yeah, the, the biggest thing that we, I think, saw uh, in confusion. I am still not hearing you, Jim, so I, I don't know if... Uh, uh, that's just me. Can someone else speak up if it's, if it's, uh, 
I can hear you, Jim. I, I can, can as well. Him. I can hear him as well. Yes, I can too. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, why don't we open this up to questions right now? Uh, you can use the chat box below uh, to send your questions in. Um, TW, can if you can hear me now, can you nod? Okay, terrific. Um, thank you. The big clarification that we we had was uh, had to do with uh, hospital employees and non-hospital employees. We'll kind of frame it like that. So, uh, just to kind of reinforce TW's message, um, if you see a and if you uh, your members or others that you pass these information to. Um, hospital sites are only for really hospital employees or those directly affiliated with the hospital. If you are in any other kind of setting or if you're a first responder, then you should be going to one of the fixed sites. Uh, so that's uh, the primary uh, message, kind of the feedback we got from, from this first week. Um, uh, just a clinical question uh, uh, for you, um, TW. Can you provide any further guidance uh, about how to counsel patients with prior history of anaphylaxis uh, to, uh, due to non-vaccine allergens. So Dr. Chan, feel free to, to step in if, you, if you'd like to provide guidance first, or if you want me to give a first crack at it, I'm happy to. Well, he had to jump off, oh. so go ahead. Listen. All right, then, then, I'll, then I'll give my, my best crack at it. So here's what, here's what I would say. Um, the guidance that we've gotten right now is that it really is, um, uh, again, like all things that we talk about, it's a risk versus benefit, right? So, so starting there, if I'm putting my provider hat on. And then the next step really comes down to what they've had anaphylaxis to. And I think this is an evolving situation where, where we're still trying to figure out specifically what it is. I think all of you have seen in the news uh, a couple of time periods where people have had anaphylaxis in general but not to any component of the vaccine or anything else. And that's where people are starting to, to bridge up against to try and figure that out. Um, I was at the fixed sites for, for a couple of hours on Saturday, um, taking a look and seeing how things ran through. And I saw, I saw two people anecdotally that, that went through that had um, allergies. One had an allergy to shellfish and decided to get vaccinated, um, had no reaction whatsoever. Um, and then I had another person that I saw that had anaphylaxis and to um, a nut allergy and got vaccinated with no reaction whatsoever. That being said, I know that nationally we have seen, um, we have seen a couple of times where people have anaphylaxis and we're still trying to figure out good rationale of why that case is happening. So that's, the, that's unfortunately the, the best that I, can, that I can do for you. Thank you. We'll uh, we'll get. Thank you for that question, and we'll get more information out to to everyone participating. Um, uh, question about uh, what is the anticipated vaccine supply uh, over the the next week that you you think you're going to have coming in? Thank you. So actually, after I get done with this call, I'm going to uh, go and and find out from our staff um, if uh, Operation Warp Speed has uploaded it. Um, what we've had messaged out is that we would have probably right around 8,000 doses so far, um, maybe a little bit over for our, our vaccine allocation. But there's a, couple of, there's a couple of caveats that I wanna put towards that. Number one, we have some doses from this week, depending on how we're launching and, and how things are being set up, that may not get used this week because of signups or whatnot. So we have the ability to possibly open up more clinics into next week that's beyond those 8,000 doses, but we have to play with, with what that looks like and the numbers coming in. So, so that's, that's what's on tap for us next week. Um, again, those 8,000 doses are Moderna doses. Um, my, uh, what I'm tracking right now in terms of our numbers is that all of our Pfizer allocation will go to um, the long-term care facility program um, and the, the partnership there. Um, we, last week, we got a little bit of a bump where we got a, a little over, uh, we got about 1,900 doses from Pfizer that we weren't expecting. So again, week to week, it's a little bit different, but our numbers overall are still very low. Yeah, thank you, TW. And I think that's the watch we're going forward our, is supply is probably going to be uh, as big of a challenge um, as having our allocation sites up and going. There's a question here from Katie Lilly. She says, we're on a medical staff at a hospital. 
um, but work in a freestanding clinic are not employed at that hospital. Which site should we get vaccinated at? Um, my advice would be talk to the hospital first to see if they plan on vaccinating you. If not, um, then I would go to one of the fixed sites. Does that seem about right, TW? Absolutely. So we, we worked with the hospitals to get their, the, the number of clinics affiliated with them in terms of the ambulatory care. So um, that's, that's where I would direct you to first to, to do that if there's ambiguity as to whether or not you, know, you are affiliated with them or, or not. And if you're not, then by all means, come on down and we'll, we'll get you vaccinated in the fixed sites. So other information that we're getting in is uh, various uh, health uh, healthcare workers have signed up, but haven't received any uh, feedback or haven't gotten any materials back. What, what, how can we help set their expectations? Excellent. So thank you for the question. I think that, um, so what I was talking about in terms of the, the difference, so by sign up, I'm going to assume that what you did was you went on to the portal, you filled out the online form, you completed that form, and now you're waiting for an actual invitation into VAMS to get to get vaccinated. That invitation and that 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 to come in and get scheduled in VAMS, that's the part that I was talking about, is that portion of being delayed in terms of the response that depends on the allocation that we get in each week. Right now, as of yesterday at about three, I was told that um, you should get a response back in about five days. What I expect is, is that as the numbers grow in that queue, that will be pushed out into longer time periods because again, we're not quite sure what we're gonna get each week. So we're trying to do everything that we can to not over allocate or set up you to have a time to get, to get scheduled to be vaccinated and there be no vaccine or we gotta cancel. So it's a, it's a logistics shell game, unfortunately. Okay, um, the next kind of question, just kind of looking forward, um, given our, our current supply, what would be your best guesstimate of when we start rolling into the one phase one B? Thank you for that question. So um, when, I'm, when I'm working through this, it's really going to depend on vaccine supply. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna answer this question based on our current allocations. If our current allocations do not go up, then I anticipate starting to start 1B in probably the last two weeks of January or the first week in February. So somewhere right around that three week time period would be my best guess of, of when we're starting. Great, and just a clarification that was asked, uh, when we say we have about 8,000 uh, uh, Vera uh, doses coming in, does that mean that 8,000 individuals will get their first dose? Uh, or is it held back for the second dose so it's only 4,000 that are distributed? Thank you, thank you, great question. So when we're talking about doses coming into the state, we're always talking about first doses when we share those numbers with, with, with the public. So we're talking about first dose allocation. The second doses get held at the federal level and then get distributed on week three or week four, depending on the vaccine presentation type. Uh, great, from what you're, you're seeing, uh, uh, moving forward is, do you have any sense of kind of maximum cap, uh, capability that you'll be able to have through the fixed sites? Um, Great question. So right now our goal is to get to um, around 20 to 25 people per hour through uh, per vaccinator in, in the group. So basically what we're doing is we're looking at going through, let me rephrase that, 20 to 25 people going through a, a single line. So that involves a couple of vaccinator stations and whatnot to go through. So if we get up to that capability, you're looking at, um, um, you're looking at a, a fairly high output. So on any given day, we have 10 fixed sites. And let's say that I don't bump it up to 25, but instead I say at 20 an hour, you're still looking at um, you know, 20, 20, uh, 20 doses per lane. And if we have one lane at every site, which is what we have currently right now, but that we're gonna open up more sites or more lanes as we go, then we're looking at expanding that capacity. We're eventually looking at expanding the capacity to, I believe it was 24 or 26 lanes. So if I do the math on that real quick, so if we're talking 24 lanes at 20 people an hour, um, then you're looking at 480 people an hour going through. 
Thank you, TW. Great, great answer. Um, uh, just a question about contingencies at each of these drive through or fixed site locations uh, for uh, severe reactions. What kind of protocols do you have in place? Excellent. Thank you for that question. So we have, um, we have emergency guidance that's been issued by Dr. Chan. Um, we have epinephrine on site. We have um, trained, uh, trained people that are there. So when I talk about trained people, I talk about um, right now we have National Guard that's deployed to these sites. So these are Army medics, these are PAs, NPs, um, and, and others that have uh, that are are signed up through the Guard that are that are in this process and setting it up, as well as then falling back on 911 to uh, to call as soon as as soon as something something obviously anytime that you administer epinephrine, then then we want to get 911 there and, and get them in to to be um, evaluated in a hospital. Okay. Uh, another uh, kind of logistics question here, um, asking when can second doses uh, be scheduled? Are they scheduled immediately after the first dose is administered or how does that work? Great, so um, when, when you go through, if you have submitted your email and, um, and done an email reminder, so again, we're, we're using that, that, that frame of emails for, for, uh, for BAMs, then what ends up happening is, as a part of that, you enter a cell phone number. And when you enter in that cell phone number, VAMS, after you've gone through and registered and all that stuff, it then um, sends you a reminder within, I think, I think it's three to four days after getting vaccinated to, to have you go in and schedule a time for you to, to get your second dose administered. So you can then go in at that point and, uh, and sign up for your second dose. Thank you. Um, a, a question here, is, and I think this has to do with uh, more uh, 1B, um, but if they're not uh, on the list, um, as example, um, the question is uh, organizational affiliation with the drop down box, uh, how should school nur nurses uh, be listed? Well, I guess the question, will additional fields be made available um, as uh, the phase changes for specific groups? So, so the first thing that I'll say is school nurses is a, are included in 1A as uh, healthcare workers in other settings. So that's the, that's the first part of that that I would say is, is categorized. Um, the, the second part that I would say is that if there are health workers that are not affiliated uh, or, or that are not called out in terms of these areas, um, the ones that are not called out, my understanding is, is that it's a pretty broad capture. So when you're talking about those that aren't in it, I'm talking about lowest risk stratification, right? So if I'm an MD, if I'm a DO, if I'm a nurse, whatever, whatever my category is, but I'm sitting here behind the desk the whole time and I'm not going out and talking to patients and I'm not having that exposure, and whatnot ever, then I'm in that lowest risk category, right? So that lowest risk category of health healthcare workers is right now in our plan to be vaccinated as a part of 1B, that's one Bravo. But that 1B plan is currently now being vetted and going up the chain. So I tell you that just to simply be transparent in the fact that we're pushing that forward. Um, for those of you who follow CDC's guidance, um, Right now, there's a little bit of a difference in terms of what CDC has recommended for 1B versus what we're looking at in New Hampshire. And so um, what I will say is, is that out of that in New Hampshire, I think we're taking a more measured approach to combining both essential workers, which healthcare workers would fit into, and highest risk general population. And we're trying to do that concurrently or equally in 1B. So that's a little bit different than the, than the national guidance um, from ACIP. So, if that gets vetted and, and approved at the at the highest levels, um, so governor's office and all that jazz, then then uh, everyone's on board with it, then that that'll be the strategy that, that we'll then share with everyone. Great. Um, this is just a little bit of a comment. If there are any uh, individuals here on this call who are interested in having their facility or clinic uh, become a provider to distribute the vaccine. Uh, uh, to take a little burden off the, the department, please email me directly and we'll make sure that you get the instructions and the forms. Um, but we'll make those available. Uh, and they were in several guidances that went out. 
Um, but please uh, email at james.potter, P-O-T-T-E-R, at nhms.org. We'll post that up um, as we go forward. Just a follow-up question from that we heard last week. Uh, should someone uh, who had COVID-19 and test positive for antibodies get the vaccine? So thank you very much, Jim. And, and the other thing that I would say is that there's a HAN that's scheduled to go out, I believe, later on today that will also give you a direct link as to where that you can get the provider agreement as well. So um, just, just, to, just to let people know, as well as uh, directly with the link to, to sign up and whatnot. So, um, and that's for you signing up as an individual and then a provider agreement for you um, being a purveyor of this vaccine, so to speak. Um, to get back to, to your question, Jim, of, of what you were saying in terms of the, um, uh, the sorry, I just drew a blank. If uh, someone who's had COVID-19 and tests positive for the antibodies, should they get a vaccine? Thank you. So for those that, that, um, that have had COVID, we want them to get the vaccine. Now let's talk about timeframes here because those are essential as well. We want them to not be in their infectious period, right? When they come through the line and, and, and come out. So we want them to, to finish, their, finish their protocols so that they're not infectious, right? We want them to finish their isolation. Um, if they've been exposed, we want them to, um, to go through all of those steps and make sure that, we're, that whether or not they're in quarantine or isolation or whatever their possible exposure was, or if they've gotten COVID themselves, we want to make sure that you're not infectious, and then we want you to sign up and, and get the vaccine as soon as possible. So no delay after, after those periods have passed. Right. This question is really, are you using the VAM system right now for the most uh, risk uh, individuals, um, or can others who uh, uh, an ambulatory uh, setting would consider moderate or lower risk in phase 1A, should they be signing up now or should they be waiting? I would, I would ask that those in the moderate risk category wait to sign up in, in VAMS. We will send out guidance once we switch those categories so that everyone's clear on, on which areas to go. But um, right now, we're, our screening questions and everything else are for most risk um, healthcare workers. And that's what we're working with VAMS to, to do right now. Um, terrific. Um, if we have some further questions, uh, we have a little bit more time left. Um, uh, going uh, going forward, let me see if I can find uh, another kind of question. Um, if a facility becomes a provider, uh, as example, a home health agency, uh, or other uh, or other others with patients, can the facility provide it to their staff as well as patients? Yes, so when we get to 1B, if for whatever reason your, your entire staff had not been vaccinated, so let's assume that you have lowest risk staff or you have people that were at a higher category level and maybe they chose to wait to get, to get vaccinated for whatever reason, then yes, at that point you could, you could vaccinate both your, both your staff and your, and your patients. Great, this is from a, a home care hospice. Um, uh, I've heard some organizations say they will stagger vaccinating their staff to avoid potential staff shortages due to possible short-term side effects. Do you advise this or should organizations register all their staff since it would take time for appointments? I, I think there's a couple of different ways to, to do this. The first thing that I would say is, is that if you have them sign up in the, in the most risk category, my guess is that they're going to be staggered anyway in terms of um, when their name gets called and, and whatnot. You could also work to say, hey, whenever you, you get in, you could set up a, a Google Doc or whatever else you'd like to, to coordinate with your facility so that people know when they're, when they're getting vaccinated if you want to do that. Again, I recognize that we're kind of skating the realm of PHI and things like that. So um, you, know, you're, you, wanna, you wanna think through whatever your organization allows and whatever people are comfortable communicating on in terms of whether or not they get vaccinated or not, but within those realms, then um, you can you can uh, then try to organize amongst yourselves how to get it. Anecdotally, I will say that of the uh, let's see here, I know of a group of 300 that got vaccinated um, in on Saturday. 
and only one of those had systemic side effects that kept them from working the next day. So, um, so that's that's much less than the percentages that that we've seen so far. But again, that's just anecdotally. So, I would always just encourage you guys to make sure that you have, you know, good operations um, and and good continuity, right? So, we we definitely don't want to to hamstring your organization by saying, you know, everyone get vaccinated and then. If it turns out that the odds are not in your favor and half of your staff end up with with fever for a day or two, you know, I don't want that to, I don't want that to hurt you. The question, next question is, uh, TW, uh, what kind of uh, uh, information or IDs are required um, at the site to, to verify uh, that they're uh, someone who works? And this is a, a situation where they have uh, uh, staff who work in New Hampshire, um, but uh, have uh, uh, live in Ver uh, Vermont, and I think their central office uses a site in Vermont, so it's a little confusing. So what kind of information is needed uh, at the sites? So what we need, so in that specific situation, so first thing that I'll say is for everyone coming, we need a photo ID, right? So we need a photo ID of a, of, a, of a you know New Hampshire driver's license or something like that 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 we can check and say that yes you are TW and and that's that's the right slot and everything else so that's the first part then when you get into um, those that are citizens in other states but are a part of our essential workforce here in New Hampshire we just need a way of of proving that uh, that they are working here in New Hampshire so that involves either a pay stub or a facility ID, um, either one of those could work to, to basically verify that, yes, you are affiliated here in, in New Hampshire as an essential worker. Great. Um, uh, Brian, if you could, uh, could you turn on uh, Steve Onan's uh, phone? Uh, Steve is uh, uh, with the New Hampshire Hospital Associates. Steve, go ahead. Great. Thank you very much, Jim. And thank you, TW. Lots of great information. I just want to sort of reemphasize the point that both TW and, and Jim made um, when folks are going in and actually scheduling their appointments to be vaccinated to make certain that you're sort of signing up for the right clinic. Um, as TW and Jim noted, we've certainly seen some challenges um, where folks have signed up at hospital sites, which unfortunately means that those appointments have to be canceled. And um, because obviously with limited supplies, we've got to make certain that we're vaccinating, vaccinating the right people in the right you know, time in the right place. Um, it's an unfortunate, you know, challenge given the, the VAM software. Um, you know, we're working to try and, 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 and address that as best we can. But I think the, the most effective thing is just when people are signing up, um, when you're, you know, communicating with, with all your folks to make certain that they know to go in and sign up for the correct site um, so that we avoid, you know, any confusion and all of that. But uh, again, thanks, TW. Thanks, Jim, for that. I just wanted to sort of, sort of reemphasize um, the importance of that. Point. Right. Thank um, you. There's a go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I just say one other thing. Thank you, Steve, for that. The other thing that I would say as a follow up is, is hopefully we will not have anyone in this situation. But if you did by chance sign up for the wrong clinic and you get canceled, you can go right back into VAMS and schedule it for the right clinic. So you have the ability to do that in the system. I do know of a couple of individuals that did that and um, went back in, scheduled for the right clinic and whatnot. So you don't need to start the whole process over or anything like that, just, just so that we're all on the same page. But again, the best thing that you can do is make sure that you're going to the right site to do that because then that'll avoid these cancellations. Great, thanks to you, Ken. Thanks, Steve. Um, uh, TW, can you uh, clarify just for the uh, most, uh, most risk healthcare workers, um, uh, should they be registering uh, uh, independently um, for, you know, through the VAM system, um, or is their agency or hospital responsible for identifying them and, and registering them? Thank you. So I, I appreciate this. So this is, uh, let, let's talk about the theoretical and the, and the practical out of this. So, so the, the theoretical is that we don't ever want to put a, a person in the, in the position of having to disclose any form of medical information to their to their um, to their employer unless it's appropriate right so 
So out of that, what that ends up meaning is, is that the way that the system is set up is at the individual level. So the individual is the one that goes in and fills out the form, answers the questions, make sure that they have the information. And that's important for equity, um, knowledge, making sure that things go through. You don't wanna be in a situation where you have to ask your employees if they're pregnant or not to answer the screening questions for them to, to go through or whatnot. So we need them to answer it at the individual level. Now, that being said, um, if I was putting my manager hat on and I was and I was back managing a unit at a hospital or at an ambulatory care center and I was trying to do that, I'd also want to communicate to my staff that, hey, as best we can, I'd like us to, to, to separate out. So if you're comfortable sharing with me when you're getting vaccinated, what we can do is we can try and, and, and take a couple of days of staggering in between our our, our individuals as when, as when you're doing that so that we can figure that out and, and go through with that. That's the same guidance that we've given law enforcement. That's the same guidance that we've given um, other first responders, fire and EMS, um, as well as the hospitals. As much as they can to try and, and organize that at the local level, that's probably your best way to achieve both of those goals. Terrific. Thanks again, TW. That's uh, it's tricky, but thank you for clarifying that. Um, uh, there uh, is some questions coming through, some confusion about uh, where to go to, to sign up uh, through VAMS. Um, uh, I'll just say that in the guidance from the 24th that was widely distributed, but if, again, you don't, didn't receive it or can't find it, please email me directly. Um, it's also available on the vaccine planning site, but um, if you uh, if you look at that particular guidance at the page top of page two, you'll see the link uh, to go in. And we'll try to clarify that in uh, our, our next messaging uh, this week to help make sure that uh, you you can get registered if you desire to do that. Um, question is, can they view VIX uh, VIX sites uh, before they register? And as as I recall from the guidance on the twenty fourth, there was a listing of the towns. Um, but not necessarily the fixed sites. I'm not sure if they're asking for more specific information or if they can view, or is, does that happen once once they register? So once, thank you for that. So once you register, that is when you get um, the information of of where where what your options are, which fixed sites are available, and things like that. The general guidance that went out, I think, listed towns so that you had an awareness of it. Um, I'll also say that our, our clinics are running Tuesday through Saturdays, um, but you'll get specific information about hours and things like that. What we've done is, is to start off, right? We're starting off in a theoretical model where we say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do an eight hour day. We're going to start it at, let's say it's 9 a.m. on Tuesdays, and we're going to slowly go up and, and start one hour later through the Tuesday through Friday, so we can get some evening shifts in, we can get some morning shifts in, and then we also have a Saturday setting. Now that's that's the theory. We'll see as people sign up what the what the you know what if any there are issues of. If we find that no one's signing up right around, you know, no one signs up in the morning, then we'll look at shifting those hours and trying to accommodate people accordingly. So our our, our goal really is is to try and be as as uh, client driven as we can in terms of our scheduling. Uh, terrific, well, we're winding up on the hour uh, and we wanna make sure not to go over because I'm sure TW, they may have you on, a, on another call here right afterward. Um, but I wanna thank you again for, for coming online and thank Dr. Chan for, for his time. Um, if you have any further questions, um, we'll stay on for a little bit and we'll try to answer those directly for you uh, just using the chat box. But I know TW has uh, other things to do. Otherwise, um, we will be back here uh, next Tuesday. Um, and maybe we'll talk. Uh, there have been um, some requests just to kind of walk through the process, uh, maybe a lot. Maybe that's something that we can try to set up with uh, some, some of the other uh, DBKH uh, S staff um, uh, for, for next week. Um, but Thank you, TW, for your time today, as always. And uh, we'll be back here next Tuesday at noon uh, with uh, Dr. Chan and TW again um, as we move forward uh, with the uh, 1A uh, phase of the vaccine allocation process. 
thank you all for joining. And uh, if you have any questions, please email me. If you have other thoughts on what we should be focusing on. I know as we move uh, into uh, 1B and to 2, we'll probably also start shifting uh, in discussion about uh, communications um, and influencers and how can we, as we move into the general population, how uh, we can uh, affect uh, our immunization rates. So some strategy development on what the department has developed in its communications plans will probably be coming forward um, in these meetings. TW, any uh, last thoughts before we leave? Um, I just want to say, so so thank you, Jim. Um, posted in the chat is the direct link to sign up. So if for some reason you lost the email or, or whatever else, just want to point that out. So that's that um, that's that that link that's that's in the chat that starts off with the prd.blogs. So um, that's where you would go to fill out that form in case anyone was having any challenges with that. I would say that CDC has developed a lot of messaging around uh, COVID vaccine. I know that Dr. Jan and Dr. Talbot have put out in, in the various HANs um, uh, some guidance on how to have some of the conversations, what what they'd recommend, how to talk about risks and benefits and things like that. So, so those are the those are the resources that I can offer right now. And thank you all very much for what you do every day. Thank you guys for for being on the call and being interested. And and we appreciate you as partners. Uh, thanks again, everyone. And we'll see you uh, next week at this same time. Take care.